Amen. I'm going to turn in the Bible to the book of 1 Peter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. And I want to speak to you today just quickly on the subject of who are you? Somebody say that. Who are you? Who are you? 1 Peter 2 and 9 offers you this. I hate to answer the question this early, but this is what it says. But you are. Somebody say, I am. am. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. If you put your Bibles down and lift your hands to the Lord one more time this morning. Jesus, we love you and we lift you up. We're so thankful for your power and your presence in this house. I pray that for the next few minutes you would anoint us both to speak and to receive. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in this place. I pray that God you would move. I pray that God you would inspire. I pray that God you would take us deeper in Jesus' name. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated today. Again, thank you for being here. Who are you? Amen. I, I want to steal a little from uh, the book of Mark chapter 4 and cover this quickly. Uh, again, I, I plan to be uh, brief with you this morning. But Mark chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 14. I'm going to read down to verse 20. Uh, you may have it in red letters there as Jesus is speaking. And this is what it says. The Bible warns us. About four different groups, three of which fail. Everybody say fail. All right, so here is the first group in Scripture that God wants us to be aware of. Bible says in Mark 4, uh, 4 and 14, the sower sows the word. In verse 15, the first group are the never Christians. Somebody say never Christians. All right, these are the ones that probably do not sit amongst us today. The Bible says these are they by the, uh, by the wayside that when the word is sown, they hear it. Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word that was sown in their heart. There are some that no matter how great the word, how great the song, how impressive the building, they never consent to repent. They never consent to be baptized in Jesus' name and let God fill them with the Holy Ghost. They are the never Christians. But he went on from that group. That is not the only group that fails. He went on to give us two additional ones. The next is those that are broken by external pressure. In verse 16 it says, And these are they likewise. Likewise, meaning just like the other group, they fail. These are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, they receive it with gladness. So I would say they are amongst us at some point. But they have no root in themselves and they endure only for a time. And afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. It paints a picture. People that come in, they love the church. They love the fire. They love the fervor. They consent. They join the assembly. But at some point, the external pressure is too great, and they fold. Now there is yet another group that fails. These are those broken by internal pressure. Verse 18 says, these are they that are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So that individual isn't uh, offended by external persecutions or afflictions, but internally they have a war raging as to what they will love and what they will pursue. It says for some it's going to be riches, for some it's going to be lust and other things that enter into the heart. 
and they fail. But Jesus concludes saying, as we know, not everybody fails. There is a different group entirely. And in verse 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. And they bring forth fruit, some 34, some 60, and some 100. Hey, I know not everybody wants to be a Christian and not everybody will stick it out. But I want to be such that I am good soil and I bear good fruit for the kingdom. Kingdom. I want to be here in five years and ten years and twenty years. I want my children here and my grandchildren here. I refuse to fail for God. I refuse. So my question today to this group is what kind of person are you? Who are you? How will time test you? Where will you be found? You know, if I was to describe your faith, who are you? If I was to describe your lifestyle, who are you? If I stood back and I looked at the totality of who you are, who are you by external deduction? How do you spend your time? How do you dream? What are your goals? What are your ambitions? Who are you today? Now, I made an absolutely weird request, but I want to use this illustration. I don't know if they were able to track it down, but we'll give it a shot. Of, of them trying to find this crazy picture, and uh, we'll try and put it up on the screens for you here. Uh, and if it works, great. If not, I'll describe it to you. Oh, look at that. We've got it. All right. Now, I want to just give you an illustration as we talk about this subject of who we are. This is from Rome. Let me give you a little backstory. That... Crazy etching is a carving that they found as they were excavating for construction. And this is an evidently common deal in Italy. As you go to put the next foundation in, you, you end up running into some artifacts that could be a thousand years old plus. As they were putting in this building, they began to excavate and they uncovered a much older structure underground. Now the story is that this structure was probably some sort of schoolhouse. It had been closed and it was a building on the side of the, the main road in the street. In this building, as you could get out of the sun and take some shelter, the soldiers would come and they would sit and congregate. They would take their lunch breaks and what have you. And then step out of the building back onto the main road and resume their duties. Etched onto that wall was this. If you can't quite see the depiction, there is, and they've, uh, you can even Google this. Uh, <clears throat> there is a donkey that is crucified on a cross. Next to that donkey is the figure of a soldier. Now, of course, a very crude carving. He even has some of his soldier's gear on. Figure of a soldier, and there is underneath it written uh, a little Greek sentence there. And so what the text reads, if you were to read the Greek and translate it back into English, is Alexa Menos worships his God. Alexa Menos worships his God. Alexamenos presumably is the figure, the soldier, that is depicted in the lower left of the picture, worshiping Jesus, who they're trying to make a mockery of, and depicting him as a donkey. And they etch that simple term in mockery of both Alexamenos and Jesus. Alexamenos worships his God. <clears throat> you know, something happened. In the life of Aleximenos that nobody knows. But Aleximenos was converted to Christianity. And he literally would have been one of the first and one of the only converts in his circle. This picture was literally etched into that rock around the year 100 to 150 AD. Thousands of years ago. 
It could have been that this was one of Cornelius' converts. But <clears throat> he is changed, Alexamenos, by this conversion. And he becomes recognizably different now. He's notable, not for his personality, not for his job performance, but he is simply referred to as the worshiper. It has consumed his speech. It has consumed his schedule. It has consumed his focus. And now those that work with him, that live beside him, have seen him and heard him worship. They mock him for his differences. But he remains vocal about his worship and who he worships. <clears throat> his worship transforms him. This is his new passion. This is his new identity. Alexamenos worships his God. But I want you to imagine what his life was like. The reality of this. And I'm, I'm being theoretical. This is, you know, some historical drawing. We don't know much. But if Alexamenos is, as everybody thinks, he was a Roman soldier converted to Christianity... Imagine the amount of scrutiny that he lived under. You know, this is not the most theologically impressed, philosophically equitable group that he would have worked beside. I imagine this is, you know, what we, we'll say, it's like being with the construction guys times a hundred. These are rowdy dudes. They were paid to be direct. They were paid to be vocal. They were paid to be abrasive and not a one of them would have been worshipers of the Christ. And now he is the outlier and they attack him. His ideologies aren't shared. This isn't a culture of tolerance. You see, they're given to wine and he wasn't now. They would swear he wouldn't now. They would go out with women. He wouldn't now. They live for themselves, but he lived to worship. Imagine what Alexamenos lived. If they were painting that on the walls, imagine the mockery. Imagine the shame, the embarrassment, the persecution. You know, in your school, in your workplace, in your city, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you look the same as everybody else? Or do you stand out? The American Christian will war with several competing ideals and priorities and identities. And we err if we live chiefly for anything other than worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I ought to look different, talk different, act different than them I am around. My, uh, if I was to give you a few things quickly, I would say my biggest concern is that we would live for possessions, prestige, popularity, power, passions, people, or play. I'll say that again. Everybody is living in a different place today, but these are going to be the strongest ideologies that you're going to war with within yourself. Possessions, prestige, popularity, power, passions, people, or play. Those that you live beside at work, at school, probably live for one of those things before everything else in their life. As I look at history and I see this image in textbooks, this man appeared as though he lived com conflicting and a competing ideal to everybody around him. He was obviously different and it became detestable to his peers that had other priorities. It was confusing to them. It was convicting to them because they lived with no Lord in their life. But for this one man, chief above all that he did was that Lord. 
So this is what I want you to see. You know, Aleximenos, and this is something, again, you can Google and look at later, but Aleximenos is not recorded as history's greatest soldier. He is not recorded as the richest man. He is not the best commander. He's not the most popular. There is nothing worthy to pen in history about his house, about his bank account, about his chariots. We don't even know if he had a family. But what do we know? Aleximenos was a worshiper. You know, today they may not be mutually exclusive. You can work. You can have a family. You can go to school. You can get a degree. And you should pursue those things. But at the end of the day, if only one ideal will define your life, it cannot be the possessions. It can't be the positions. It can't be the pedigree. It has got to be that you and I are worshipers. It has got to be our faith. It has got to be our our God. We have got to live beyond ourselves and beyond the present world that we see. We have got to live by faith. Come on, somebody. We've got to live for the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Come on, you can't take the money with you. You can't take your car with you. You can't take your house with you. But what God can give you and wants to do in you will save your so I want to talk to somebody today about being a worshiper come on you're in the world but not of the world I know that you've got to work but you weren't made to be a worker you were made to be a worshiper who am I who am I? At the end of the day, I am not a doctor. At the end of the day, I'm not defined by degrees. I'm not defined by what's in the bank account. I'm not defined by what's parked in my driveway. I am defined as a worshiper. I am a child of the king. I am blood bought and spirit filled. There is nothing greater you can have than being a worshiper. And our legacies will be reduced to the greatest of our loves. When Elon Musk passes away, what will we talk about? His greatest love. That company he started, and if you watch the documentaries, he poured so much time and energy and sleepless nights into forming. When Steve Jobs passed away, what did they talk about? The company, the industry, the innovation, etc. When I pass away, don't you dare talk about my stethoscope or my white coat. When I pass away, don't you dare talk about the cars that I drove. But I pray that my funeral would be such. They said he was a worshiper. He may have done this, that, and the other. But he was a worshiper. And he led others to worship. So the interesting thing is how history would remember Aleximenos. They etched that crude carving with intention to embarrass him, to make a mockery of him. But today, let me ask you a question. Do you think we even know who put that in the wall? Not a clue. All of his adversaries are forgotten in the passage of time, the name that remains in every book is Aleximenos. You know, friend, it may look bad and bleak for you now, but you give God some time. Nobody's going to remember your adversary. You're not even going to remember the trials that you went to, but your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let me tell you what God did through one worshiper and why we talk about Alexa Manos. And I, I mean, in, in uh, university circles, we talk about Alexa Manos. That horrible drawing, if you were to ignore everything in your Bible and say, 
Because in certain circles, in academic circles, you can't qualify the life of Christ with his biography. It seems like cheating. And so in academic circles, they'll say, okay, prove me Jesus, but don't use your book. Show me something that came out of the ground. That silly drawing is the earliest proven record of the life of of Christ and his crucifixion that has ever been found. That silly drawing that was intended to mock and ridicule that man, make a mockery of his God, ended up being the greatest extra biblical proof that that God did live and that God was crucified. You know what? That little mockery ends up taught in universities around the world. It's in textbooks around the world. It is in the sense one of the greatest ways that we can prove Jesus lived. Hear me, friend. I don't know which one of you feel like Alexa Manos. You feel like you're a nobody in the middle of a world that doesn't believe like you do. You live under persecution and you live in unpopular view. I would tell you today that God can still work greatness through you. Stick to the course and see what God will do. Amen. If I'm to be defined by something, let it be that I am a fanatic for Christ. If I'm going to be ridiculed for something, let it be for Him. If I'm going to spend for something, give my time to something, give my energy to something, my effort, let it be for Him. If I'm to be notable for anything in this life, I want to be a worshiper. I might not be much, but what I am is God's entirely. You know, the thing I love about Alexa Mandels is how little we know. And by that we would derive that he probably was no man of significance. He exists nowhere else in history. That aligns with what we see in scripture. Because the fatherless Abraham was small before God got to him. You know the has been Moses that was tending sheep in the wilderness. He was small. He was insignificant before God got to him. Elijah was a nobody from nowhere. A, a Tishbite. A city never even mentioned in scripture he was small and insignificant before God called him David was small in fact there was a handful of 12 small fishermen and tax collectors and etc that were all insignificant before God got to them Paul was just another one of many pharisaical enemies he was small he was a nothing he was a nobody so yes you may be outnumbered you might live in a world that doesn't believe like you do doesn't understand understand why you worship the way that you do but what could God do with your life if you gave it to him fully who are you in God are you a worshiper or like everybody else do you fit in or do you stand out oh come on somebody don't be quiet be a worshiper Amen. I'll have you stand together with me today. Amen. I, as, as we were singing, and I knew I was going to try sharing this wacky history story. I actually really hate history. If you ask me what World War I was about, I couldn't even answer. I have to like really research this stuff because the way that my school worked out, I never took a history class in my life. Because uh, I was in a different track, not, not the humanities track, and I moved different countries, and I mean, I, I took like Canadian history, but they don't have any, so that was a, that was a waste. So I have to really dig into this stuff, and, and I uh, was, you know, looking at this, and articles, and pages, and books. One of the most interesting things about it was the second carving that they found in that room. And the attention is all drawn to the one that we displayed to you. It has theologic significance, etc., etched in the Greek, Alexamenos, and the picture of Christ as a mockery. On the reverse wall, where if you were sitting and looking at that, somebody couldn't handle it anymore. It may have been Alexamenos, it may have been a friend, a co worker, whatever. 
Somebody couldn't look at that every day on their lunch break and not say something back. And so they turned around and on the back wall, written in Greek, was Aleximenos Fidelis, or Aleximenos is faithful. Aleximenos is faithful. Take him or leave him, the dude's faithful. We might change what we like, but 10 years from now, he'll still be a worshiper. You know, I, I, and I was thinking about that, and as we worshiped, I thought, God, if I'm going to be anything, let me be faithful. Let what I have in my heart be given over into my children, be represented in the next generation and the generations down from me. Let me be unwavering in my worship unwavering in my passion unwavering in my fire let me be found faithful lord Aximenos is faithful i would ask you who are you who are you today could somebody etch that in description of your life that you're faithful when the storms come you're still in the house of God with your hands lifted. When temptation comes, you're still in the house of God lifting up holy and blameless hands. You're faithful. Are you here when you feel like it and here when you don't? Are you here in a midweek and mom's out sick with the kids lined up and your hands lifted faithful? Are you here when it's unpopular? Are you here when it's hard? Are you here when it's a sacrifice? I want to be found faithful. So I close with what we opened with 1 Peter 2 and 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't have time to give you my full story, but I'll just tell you this. At multiple decision points, this is the number one thing that I have had to war with in my spirit. When I came into the church... I was raised in a millionaire's home, the son of a doctor. My mom was a nurse, very high profile, and they didn't approve of my decisions and etc. And it came down to an ultimatum where I would have to serve God or continue to live the life that I had enjoyed and loved and school would be paid for and on and on and on. But at the end of the day, I couldn't get away from trying to reconcile that decision and knowing that if I was to have anything in the end, do I want it to be money? Do I want it to be degrees or do I? I want it to be God and for me the answer has always been him and so even coming into the church I had to lose everything every dollar every friend every family member everything I'd known become literally homeless overnight and it was all worth it because I had him and as my walk has continued you put yourself back in school you start getting a job. You know, it's crazy. The first job interview I ever had, the first one, they wanted me to work on Sundays, every other Sunday. And I felt that same decision point. God, what am I going to love more? The money or you? And I just, I wanted him. And in that interview, I sat and I looked at that lady's face and I said, I'm sorry. I know this is the only this is the only call back I got after getting my first degree. I want this job so bad, but I cannot agree to take any job that has me routinely missing. This wasn't a one-off. This is routinely missing Sundays. And she stopped. She looked at me. She said, I have never heard somebody say that. She said, we need somebody like you on our team. She said, give me a second. She pushed back from the desk. She walked back into HR. She came back with the HR manager and they sat down and said, Brayden, we can't give you that job you applied for. It, it requires week on, week off. But here's the thing. 
We want you so bad. They actually said this. We need a pastor here so bad. Here's what we'll do. We want to give you the supervisory position to the one that you applied for. It's Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. You'll never have to miss a service. As time would go on, there'd be other points we would make decisions like that. And I wouldn't always immediately see how God would turn it around for good. And just this last few months when we feel like God had told us it was time for us to sell what we have and begin evangelizing full time. These are wars that will go on inside of your mind and inside of your heart. And you must reconcile who is the God that you serve. What is the most important thing to you? And at the end of the day, who I am I just want to be a child of the king I just want to be a worshiper and I'm not gonna let anything else take that number one position I'm not gonna let anything else sit in that throne of my life not family not spouse not jobs not power not money he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all and today for somebody that might be struggling with priorities or ideologies I want to get things in the right order for you you were made to be a worshiper